Luke chapter 19. The Gospel of Luke chapter 19. And I'd like to read the first 10 verses. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, all murmured, saying that he has gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day salvation, er, this day is salvation, come to this house. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of God, a man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, allowing us to be here today. We thank you for this story of this man years ago who, uh, by your grace, was saved. We thank you for this one Jesus, your, your son, who came that not only that he might be saved, that we might be saved as well. We rejoice in your salvation today. We thank you so much. Forgive me of my sins and enable me to preach. We just ask that wherever this message is heard, that your work would be done. We ask that someone would be saved by the preaching of your word. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preach tonight a sinner, a savior, and a sycamore tree. Most of us have known this story since we were kids. Uh, we, there's a song that, they, that we sing about Zacchaeus. Um, and sometimes I think when we hear these songs that are, that are directed at the children, we think of these as children's stories. And it is, it, is, it is a good story to tell the kids because it's very simple. Uh, there are some simple lessons that we can learn about Jesus and, and uh, we can learn about Jesus' love. We can learn about redemption. We can learn a lot of things um, on a child's level about Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus was a real man. You know, don't belittle this story as saying, well, it's something just for little kids because this was a real man. He had real sin in his life that affected real people, and he was on his way to a real hell. So let's understand that about Zacchaeus. Now, very early on, we get a description of Zacchaeus. We understand that it talks about his position. Now, nowadays, we would say, he was a tax collector. He collected people's taxes. Now, now, to this day, people do not like tax collectors, but uh, even back then, not only do we not like, uh, you know, we don't enjoy paying more, we, we understand the necessity of taxes, surely, but at the same time, uh, we, we don't like giving up our money, do we? This man was a publican, it said, which means he was a tax collector. And um, I have a joke about that, but I won't share that with you today. Uh, but, um, well, I can see you're all ready for a joke, but uh, meet me after church and I'll tell you the joke. Um, but he was a tax collector, but he wasn't just any tax collector. You'll notice that it says he was the chief of the publicans. So not only was he a tax collector, not only was he a publican, but he was a boss. 
probably everything that they took, he even got a cut of that. He had a powerful position. I would assume, and a lot of things that, that we see uh, in, in this story, we make uh, assumptions and we, we preach on these things, and, and a lot of, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, as long as we're reasonable about it. But I would assume that people wanted to find favor. They wanted Zacchaeus to be their friend just because perhaps he would give them a break on their taxes. Whatever it was, he, he had a high position. He had a, a, an important position. He had an import, a position where not only he had control over the people, he had control over the people who had control over the people. We see his positions, we see his possessions. Verse 2 also says that he was rich. He was one of the rich people in the town of Jericho. Jericho was a significant town. It was one of the bigger towns there in the uh, um, area that, uh, there, which was uh, Israel. And he had lots of things. Sometimes our stumbling blocks are the things that we have. Now the problem with this man being rich was we're never content with what we have, are we? We, we celebrated Thanksgiving on Thursday, but honestly we all wish we had more. More of this and more of that. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. But he was rich, and, and uh, just from reading the text and what we know about tax collectors, we figure that, that most of what he got, he got I'm trying to think of a good word for it. I mean, incorrectly is not. Uh, so I supposedly, I guess he got it lawfully, but he got it unfairly. Uh, he cheated people on their taxes. But he had many, many possessions. Now this morning I talked about the publicans that were there in the early church, there in the book of Acts. And I said, to me, the astounding thing was not that Christ saved the Gentiles... It was that he saved the publicans. The point I want to make is it doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you have a, a particularly important position in the government or, or in society or you're uh, uh, famous or popular. Nothing really matters. Your possessions don't matter. All that matters and all that will matter is your relationship with Christ. Amen. Now your relationship with Christ is going to affect your, your possessions, by the way. You'll see that there was an effect once, once uh, uh, Zacchaeus came to know Christ with how he handled his possessions. And then I want to look at the presumption. What do we know about Zacchaeus? What's the first thing we, there's like two things we always think of when we hear the, the story of Zacchaeus or, or we sing that song about Zacchaeus. The very first thing, like the very first line of that song was that he was a wee little man. The scripture says that he was little of stature. Now, some people would uh, have, have taken that to mean that he was a, a dwarf or a little person or a uh, Someone like that. All we know is that he was shorter than the, the normal person. There's a presumption that, that when, in studying this that people say, well, perhaps he had a Napoleon complex. In other words, he was trying to compensate for his shortness in, 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 in stature, so he was uh, built himself into a powerful position. He built up his home. He built up his wealth. He built up his, uh, everything that he had to compensate
And all these things about him were trying to make up with the flaw that he thought he had. But once again, the flaw that we have is that we've all come short of the glory of God. For we see there is a presumption, but that we see his problem. The very first, or the very last thing we read in verse six, uh, 7, they said about Zacchaeus was he was a sinner. He was a sinner. Now all those other things were symptoms of the problem. The fact that he had taken money unfairly, we assume, was a symptom of the problem. The problem that, uh, the problem that perhaps he used his power and his possessions to make up for his shortcomings as far as his height. His, his feelings of the inadequacy, those were all symptoms. Everything about us that is flawed, it comes down to the fact that we are sinners. That we are sinners. But then we see the redirection of Zacchaeus. It says that he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he came before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for Jesus was to pass that way. Now, in, in reading that, the way I look at this, Zacchaeus wasn't really looking for a savior that day. He wasn't looking for someone who was going to change his life, and, and in changing his life, it was going to cost him many of his possessions, half of what he had. And perhaps fourfold, he said, if I, I've taken someone, but something from false accusation. Why did he want to see Jesus? Just because there was a big crowd. There was a crowd, there was a press, and, and he was curious to see what was going on. Perhaps he had heard the name Jesus, perhaps he'd heard that Jesus is coming. He wanted to see what the deal was. But then there was a divine call. He's up there in the sycamore tree. And the strangest thing happened. says in verse 5 that Jesus came to the place and he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide in thy house. Jesus called out of the multitude that was there. Jesus called Zacchaeus. Now, I don't know if he had known Zacchaeus from prior circumstance or if he knew Zacchaeus because he was God. But Jesus knew Zacchaeus. There was the divine call by Jesus, but there was the direct call by name. He called Zacchaeus by name. Now understand Jesus, the Son of God, at any point could have called anybody's name. He could have called everybody's name and divinely changed him. But that's not the way God does things. 
Jesus saw the individual, personally called him by name, and directed the call to him. It was a decisive call. He says, Zacchaeus, what? Make haste. Understand this. When God is calling you, he's calling you now. He's not calling you to come later on. He's not calling you to come in a few days. When, when, the, when the call comes out, he's calling you right now. Today is the day. That Christ calls. It is a decisive call. He said, hurry up, Zacchaeus. Come down. And it was an enduring call. He said, for today must I abide in thy house. Now, you know why they called Zacchaeus a wee little man? Because he said he made haste. He slid down out of that sycamore tree and he went, wee! And I knew when I was thinking earlier today, when I was thinking about telling that joke, that I would get that response. I actually got a little, a little bit more smile than I did. Yeah, it's a bad one, I know. I thought at least the kids wouldn't smile, but they're the only ones not smiling, so I guess I'll move on. We see the demonstration of Zacchaeus. It said he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. Now a lot of times we in sovereign grace, you know, believers, we, you know, oh, you don't come, you know, we sing that song. He came to me when I could not go to where he was. He came to me. But understand this, Zacchaeus came to Jesus. But he came to Jesus when Jesus came to Jericho. And then Jesus called him. There will be a response. We do move in the direction of Jesus when he calls. I think I missed a point. There was a bit about the call. It was an enduring call because Jesus said, Today I must abide in thy house. When Jesus calls you, you abide with him and he with you. In other words, you're saved and you're saved forever. There, this was not a temporary thing with Zacchaeus. He came to Jesus, he confessed his sins. There was a conversion that once uh, the, the, the worldly possessions were so important to him, but when he came to Jesus, when Jesus called him, he admitted that he had taken some things by false accusation. That he had padded his wallet unrighteously, unjustly. He said, I'm going to give to the poor and I'm going to repay everything four, fourfold. He confessed his sin. It is amazing to me those that profess to be saved that they cannot confess their sins. What are they saved from? What are they saved from? If, there, if, if there's, no, there's been no sin in their life, what are they saved from? Zacchaeus acknowledged. Now, sometimes I think it's easier for someone like Zacchaeus to, to confess their sins and everybody knows about it than a lot of the high and holy church people. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they were the ones that were looking down their noses when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Zacchaeus' house. Oh. 
he continued to his house. It wasn't just enough that he, that, that, that he met Jesus there. He took him home. I hope you meet with Jesus while you're here tonight. I hope if, if someone is lost that they meet him as Savior, Master, and Friend. But we need to take Jesus home with us as well. And he completed his conversion. Now, I'm not saying that he did some act in order that he might be saved. What I'm saying was the things he did, the things he did were afterwards were a testimony to the fact that he had been saved. He talks about restoration. You know, they, they, uh, you can file for bankruptcy. And I think the law's changed a little bit to, to clear some of this up. You can file for bankruptcy and then be debt free. You can build up all this debt and then file for bankruptcy and have the, uh, the, the law eliminate that debt for you. you know, that was one of the criticisms of Donald Trump that he would go and he would file for bankruptcy to get out of this debt uh, when he was running for an election. It was perfectly legal to do that. When Jesus saved Zacchaeus, he was debt free. But it was laid upon his heart to make restitution. We see restitution and we see repentance there. Now, when you read this story, you think, boy, Zacchaeus, after that, he gave all his, his debt away and the stuff that he took unfairly, he repaid fourfold. He was probably in the poorhouse after that. From what I understand from reading, historically, Zacchaeus continued to be a wealthy man. Sometimes I think we're afraid to trust God with our finances. If we give this away, we've lost it. Our Lord was more than able to supply and resupply Zacchaeus. And finally, he was confirmed by the Savior. All these accusations, I believe 9 and 10, Jesus is addressing what the, 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 the critics said. He said, this is the day is salvation come to this house for as much as he is, he also is a son of Abraham. My new pages are stick to, sticking together, I apologize. For the Son of Man has come not to seek, or has come to seek and to save, that which was lost. His salvation was confirmed by Jesus. It didn't matter what anyone else said. His salvation was confirmed by Jesus. Jesus said, this man was also a son of Abraham. He, he, he's saying, this is, a, this is another human being. This is one of your, 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 your uh, 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 brothers. You're so offended that this man has been forgiven, has been set free. But this is a human being. This is a soul that was bound for hell. And you 
who claim to be God's people are offended that I would come and I would abide and he would be forgiven. But he said, this is a soul worth saving. And he proved it when he died upon the cross. If we are to continue in the mission of Christ, our concern needs to be for souls. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. Should we not seek them out? Should we not show them Christ? Should we not pray for those souls? Let's stand.